Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. What are the possibilities for gene therapy for the treatment of dementia, or even to slow or reverse aging? Let's find out as we re-review the field and take a look at a new publication from one of the experts in this area. Patrick Sewell, MD, currently has an international medical practice specializing in regenerative medicine, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, and innovative cancer therapies. His background includes over 20 years of cancer research, including development of minimally invasive treatment and stem cell procedures. Dr. Schul's training includes internal medicine, diagnostic radiology, and interventional radiology. He received his MD and residency from Louisiana State University School of Medicine. He completed fellowships at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, where he later joined the faculty. Now, please enjoy this interview with Patrick Sewell, MD. Hey, Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. Hey, it's so, so great to have you here. I can't wait to dive into the latest news on gene transfer therapy and, you know, how you're applying it to Alzheimer's and, and even maybe longevity. Uh, but but before, we, before we talk about that, I'd love to hear from you how you got interested in such a fascinating area. Well, it, it started, uh, you know, I actually look back in my, in my career and I can see uh, a link between my work and how I ended up here. And I started in my, after I finished my training, uh, I was concentrating on cancer and I was really focused on cancer because I was dissatisfied with the treatments that were available. Um, and so I embarked down a uh, path of connecting imaging and surgery. And uh, it's, it's basically minimally invasive image guided surgery. And so I pursued these technologies about how to reach parts of the body with imaging and how to destroy tissue. And I had to get into the immune system when I really started getting into certain cancer uh, topics. And the immune system led me to stem cells and uh, regenerative biology. And that led me to gene therapy. Uh, so to me, there was a direct link, although it, it spanned about 20 years. Uh, and so probably about seven years ago, I really started the shying away from uh, focusing on cancer and focusing on modulating the immune system uh, and really uh, looking at gene therapy as a way to treat the immune system. And that got me into current diseases that people were uh, addressing with gene therapy. And, there, and that got me into dementia um, and, and hence the, the, our program. So, uh, you know, I say dementia, not specifically Alzheimer's because um, the, the group of neurodegenerative diseases that Alzheimer's a part of, there's frontal temporal dementia, uh, there's vascular dementia, but uh, I was looking at a commonality that dealt with uh, the immune system and the genes and gene therapy. So that's, that's how I ended up here. Oh, that, yeah, that's a gr great, great. And this is such a, such an exciting area. So much has happened with gene therapy in the last few years, and, and now we're even seeing it applied to humans, as we'll hear about later, I guess. But before we dive into that, maybe take a moment and just what what exactly is gene transfer therapy? What's the idea there that you're doing? So to understand gene transfer therapy, you have to look at the topic of gene therapy. Um, we all, you know, everybody knows we have chromosomes with genes on it. And uh, some of the genes can be faulty. Genes, genes, some genes are active and some are inactive. Um, and so many, many, for a long time, it's been postulated that it was hoped that we could repair a gene. Um, well, along the way, scientists dis uh, discovered and realized and developed ways to 
add genes to cells, not replace. Now we do have the ability to remove and replace genes, and that's the most sophisticated type of gene therapy. And most people know that as CRISPR. Uh, there's another one, two or three other enzymatic ways to remove genes and add genes to the DNA. Gene transfer therapy is a simpler method and it has some caveats that are particularly appealing to where we are right now in our limitations of replacing, of, of adding genes. So uh, the, the CRISPR is basically considered a permanent change. And I'm not ready to permanently change somebody's DNA until I know everything there is to know about it, which takes 15, 20 years of science to really get a good volume of knowledge about it, about a medical development. So a lesser step is gene transfer uh, technology. And that's where we give a copy of the gene to the cell. We leave the defective gene alone or we leave the gene that's turned off alone, but we give a, an exact copy. It's a human gene made in a lab and we give it to the cell and it does just what the defective gene is. So let's say you have a gene that you need to, you need to make, it needs to make calcium and you're not making enough calcium. If I give you an extra gene, it's like turbo in your engine. It produces a little more. So the extra gene can produce, make up the, the deficit of your, the gene you inherited. Now, why uh, is that a big deal? Why not just replace it? The permanent change has implications. It's passed on to your offspring. Um, and let's say you don't, say there's some unforeseen things the gene does and you've made the permanent change, you can't undo it. The gene transfer has some built-in safety. It's not passed on to your offspring. So if you're, say it's a 28 year old person and they have muscular dystrophy and we're treating them muscular dystrophy uh, and we do the therapy and 20 years later, we found out there's an issue and they've had children, then the, you can see the problem. So right now, if we did a uh, gene transfer, I mean, sorry, if we did a CRISPR that way, but if we did a gene transfer, it's kind of temporary. Uh, when I mean temporary, when the cell reproduces, it duplicates the gene that I replaced doesn't get copied because it's not part of your nuclear DNA. It's not your chromosome. So in certain tissues, well, in all tissues, it gets diluted over time. Um, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. In the brain, it's not bad because there's very little turnover of neurons that you, you, you have most of your neurons. You can make neurons, new neurons, but most of the neurons you have are there for the, your life. Um, so, but in other parts of the body, the turnover rate, like in the skin or the mucous membrane in your mouth would be several days later, that'd be a disadvantage. Um, so gene transfer therapy is where we are right now for, the, for those reasons I've discussed. Um, to get into some specifics about it, we take a virus, and we take some of the DNA out of the virus and we insert the genes that we want to give the patient. And with the case of dementia, we, in the experiment we did, we gave HTERT and Clotho. And uh, we grow that virus in the lab. And then when we get a sufficient number of viral particles that represents the, the dose, we administer that to the patient and the virus delivers the genes for us, just like viruses normally do. When we inject the virus, it behaves like a virus always does. It goes to the cell, latches on, and injects its cargo. Normally, its cargo is its own genes, but we recover, we, we've removed that and replaced it with the genes we want. It delivers our genes. So it's like a UPS truck that we fill the cargo space. We remove the cargo that the, gene, that the virus had, and we put in our cargo. Now, uh, that's the whole function of the virus. And then the virus goes away, gets consumed by the body, but it's delivered the product. After that, it's normal cellular processes that take over. And the gene that was delivered is, uh, is through a variety of cellular mechanisms incorporated into the cell and ultimately into the nucleus next to your chromosome. And it starts producing the product that we want. 
So that's gene transfer. We transfer a copy of your gene to your nucleus next to your chromosome, not weaved into your chromosome. I see. So the, the transfer is, um, so it's not reproduced when the cell reproduces, right? Yeah. Because it's not part of the chromosome then. A that's a critical distinction. Uh, yeah. At some point, we will want that. But, uh, you know, to put it in terms of, of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the work I'm doing right now is equivalent to a phase one trial. It's about safety. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tr what, I, what I really have specialized in, in the, is translational medicine. Laboratory work translated into humans, that stage right there, but the step from mice to humans, dogs to humans, whatever. Uh, that's phase one stuff. So if I was developing a drug, uh, you do it in the lab and you test it on cells and animals. And then that first phase one trial is the translation or translational medicine step from lab to, to clinic. And uh, so th that's where we are right now. Um, and safety is an issue. Uh, phase two is the largest study and phase three is really about how well it works. But along the way, you get data on all that. So gene transfer therapy is, a, is an excellent translational medical tool to investigate uh, genetic therapy. And, and the, the idea of incorporating extra copies of the gene in the, in the, in the body to accomplish some, some task, um, it, it, we really have models for it. I'm reminded of the, uh, the, the elephant famously uh, is an animal that, that gets little or no cancer in their, in their lifetime, unlike other mammals. And uh, it, we, we, people recently found out that the P53 uh, gene that, that protects to some extent against cancer, of which humans have one copy of, elephants have 20 copies of that gene. So right. yeah, so it's almost like uh, that's the idea. We just put extra copies of whatever gene we want to uh, uh, produce more proteins from or have the effect of, is, is that right? That's true. And, and that brings up a, a good caveat about translational medicine. Uh, animals and humans or mammals, non-human animals and human animals are different. And so, and some sharks and elephants don't get cancer. Uh, there are some animals that get a lot of cancer uh, and we use those to study in the lab. Um, and, and, but it also illustrates that what you, what's true for a non-human animal may or may not be true for a human animal. So that explains why many successful, we hear about all these a wonderful experiments where they cured cancer in this mouse or they did this experiment and it treated this disease successfully. It didn't pan out in humans. And that's why this step is so critical. This translational step to humans is, the, is where we really start finding out with, that our laboratory work that was so successful in that project animals, is it gonna work in us? Um, you know, our chromosomes are very similar uh, between species, between mammals, but the expression of them, uh, the enzymatic levels are quite different. Um, I could give you lots of examples of mice. We can do all sorts of great stuff with mice that doesn't work in people. And it, and it has to do not with their genes, but with their expression of their genes or the epigenetic stuff, um, which genes are turned on. And then the enzymatic functions after that. So it gets kind of complicated, but yeah, you're, you're right on about the, the difference in in genes and, and expression. And, and uh, before we get into the, the, the particular work you're doing, because I want to review your, your exciting paper that just came out, but before we do that, maybe you could uh, sort of cover the landscape about uh, some of the, the other work that's been done up to this point in uh, gene uh, transfer therapy for, for dementia, some of the other interesting studies. Yeah, um, I'll see what I can remember. There's, there's been several over the last uh, decade. Um, you know, the, uh, the, some of the topics that people might be familiar with are APOE, uh, BDNF, brain, brain, uh, brain neurotrophic factor. factor. Yeah. Um, amyloid, beta, tau protein, 
uh, oxidative stress, inflammation. Uh, these are all uh, mitochondria, hypometabolism. Um, uh, so basically there are a number of uh, proteins, enzymes, uh, structural abnormalities in the brain that are, have been implicated and even genes uh, that have been implicated in, in the uh, Alzheimer's disease. And what that told me was that Alzheimer's is a very complex system failure. And I'll get to, and that led to me to the gene therapy for dementia, not specifically Alzheimer's. Um, it would take me a while to go through uh, all the vari all the different studies, and I don't remember them off the top of my head, but suffice it to say for about 10 or maybe 15 years, there has actually been work done in, with gene therapy. It's far back as 2011, if I remember the most recent one I looked at, with uh, gene therapy for dementia uh, and uh, for Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, et cetera. And they haven't panned out. They look great in the lab. They look great in the, in the animals, but they, don't, they hadn't worked in humans. So it's been... Of excitement and, and letdown, excitement and letdown. Um, the uh, the take home message is Alzheimer's itself is complex and it's a multi system problem. But in but outside that dementia, which includes vascular dementia, frontal frontal temporal dementia, and either other dementias, is is just as, is comp more complex. Uh, but there's some commonalities. And so there's uniqueness to each disease, but the commonalities uh, is what got my interest. And so that's what we ended up focusing on. Um, the failures of those other gene therapies were critical in teaching us that it's not a simple process to treat this disease. You know, as you know from your other guests, nutrition, lifestyle, uh, uh, everything, uh, how much sleep you get. Uh, there's a number of factors that affect your, your, the, how bad your, your dementia is, whether you'll get dementia. Uh, and they're not all genetic. They're not biological. They are environmental. Uh, they are experiential, uh, how you live your life. Um, even how you think people believe uh, your mood, if you have, you know, depression or not depression, um, or positive thinking and negative thinking. So uh, I don't get into all that because there's so many good people studying that. But the, uh, so I concentrated on the, the system problem of uh, dementia. Now, what I do want to say is the other thing uh, that I realized is longevity aging, disease and aging. Aging is a system failure, a, a progressive system failure in your body. Um, and Alzheimer's and dementia are, are similar to brain aging. It's just that the disease Alzheimer's or other dementias happens faster. Memory, we all have memory loss, um, decreased ability to concentrate, our sleep is disturbed as we get older. If you think about it, the the problems that we that dementia patients suffer from, we all suffer from to a lesser degree as we age. But as we age, the, the problem those problems get greater. So I think of dementia as things gone aging gone crazy uh, in the brain, and it's accelerated the the brain aging. Now that's a real simplification, but it's a mind. It's a uh, it's kind of a uh, thought process I have because I think they're re they are related. I don't think they're related. Uh, system declines and aging of the brain and dementia, uh, the problems of dementia are parallel and similar, not identical, but there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the single the single greatest risk factor for for Alzheimer's and other dementia is age, you know, more than anything else, and and also for heart attack, stroke, sure, yeah, uh, yeah, cancer. So yeah, all these things are tied together with longevity. What, one thing I wanted to underscore too, and maybe just summarize what you said too about the past work was that um, 
uh, others, other groups have taken, taken genes and proteins. You mentioned uh, APOE2, I think, and they, one group put that in and then BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophy factor and put that in and they picked a few other ones. And, uh, you know, they've tried different gene transfer experiments and so far, um, you know, not not much results. So uh, right. that's why it's it's so exciting to talk about uh, talk about your your study here. And and maybe first, uh, let's talk about the the genes that that and the proteins that that you selected um, that other people haven't used necessarily for this yet. And why sure. did you select those? And what are they? Well, so like the APOE and the BDNF, those are uh, those are like the people who suffer from aberrations of APOE is a subset of the dementia group. Uh, the BDNF is a subset of the dementia group. And so they might respond, uh, but that doesn't address the other 90%. You know, uh, it's those, so those are uh, outliers in Alzheimer's. Um, and there's a and the rest of the group in Alzheimer's is, is, is presumed to be due to the alpha beta, I mean, the amyloid beta protein is toxic and the tau protein is toxic. So um, everybody who has Alzheimer's has problems with amyloid beta and, or, and dementia uh, and tau protein. Uh, so those appear to be bigger problems. And a lot of people have chased down those. Uh, even the recent pharmaceutical company that drug approved this year for the amyloid beta, supposedly it's, it's think it's a monoclonal antibody and it binds to the amyloid beta pro, uh, protein and the body, the immune system then removes the monoclonal antibody and the amyloid beta goes with it. The, 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 the uh, trouble and the distaste for that drug in the medical community is that it hasn't shown any improvement in the patient's symptoms. So if I say I can give you a cheeseburger and it'll reduce your amyloid beta program, amyloid beta buildup, but it doesn't make any better, is that an, is that a, is that progress, you know? So uh, I looked at, I looked at two genes that seemed to be involved that I, that through a variety of experiments done by people over the last 10 years, that seemed to be involved in not only all of the dementias, but also brain aging. And it particularly interested me. It's like uh, everybody with diabetes has trouble with insulin, you know, but not, but there's different types of diabetes. And sometimes it's not enough insulin. Sometimes the insulin is not effective. Sometimes the uh, immune system is attacking the pancreas and reducing the insulin produced. So, the, but the commonality was insulin problem. So with, with dementia, I looked at HTERD, which is a gene that makes telomerase, and Clotho, which is a gene that makes a protein called Clotho. It makes several proteins, Clotho, Alpha, Beta, but the Alpha one is particular for the brain. Um, and the reason it interested me is because, and, and HTERD will be familiar to a lot of people because it, it makes an enzyme telomerase, which lengthens your telomeres. So there's a lot of, of uh, discussion, papers, talk on telomerase and anti-aging in all the tissues, certainly the brain. Glotho there's, uh, is particularly interesting uh, because it's very important to the brain and very important to the kidney and mainly important everywhere else. So uh, what caught my attention was the two together uh, there were some few papers that suggested they were synergistic and they needed to be associated with one another to do the best job they could. But more importantly, all the patients with the, the problems they addressed, which was the buildup of the amyloid protein, the, the tau uh, protein, the uh, uh, ox increased oxidative stress on the cells, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, uh, microglia function, uh, which is like your garbage truck system of your brain. Uh, I mean, it's in your spinal cord too, but it's in your neurological system. Uh, these two proteins from these genes seem to, to be important for maintaining those. When Clotho dropped and when H dropped in neurological tissues and brain tissue, the symptoms of brain aging and symptoms of dementia increased and it seemed proportional. So 
our, we pursued that uh, those two as a treatment for is a is a treatment for the system problem in dementia. It doesn't address. I knew it wouldn't address a specific dementia, and I knew it wouldn't cure a specific dementia. But I postulated that it would improve some of the symptoms of dementia, maybe restore their memory, maybe restore their personality to a degree, et cetera. So uh, that's why we chose those because it had multiple, multiple enzymatic effects targeting multiple pathologies that were high targets, uh, high su suspected pathologies. Um, and so that's where we came up with Clotho and HTER. So it's almost like, like you say, uh, Clotho and HTER, uh... HTERT human telomerase reverse transcriptase is our systemic systemic approaches, whereas to to all of all of uh, the diseases and even even rolling back aging almost a little bit for longevity, whereas uh, doing uh, APOE2 transfer copies is only going to benefit people potentially with APOE4 uh, uh, alleles there and exactly. BDNF may target a subset of dementia patients, maybe with hippocampal atrophy or something like that. But HTRT and Clotho uh, are wide systemic and and rolling back longevity, which would benefit, which will benefit Anything. dementia and and all sorts of chronic disease. That's very exactly. very exciting. Yeah. But, so yeah, potentially. Uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease, ALS, uh, these two enzymes, these two genes and the products they produce are implicated in all of the neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, now we haven't pursued those, but, but I hope somebody does and we may. Um, we have to finish up the, the dementia. Where does this go with dementia? Um, but the, but you're right. These are, these are, global systems that decline in everybody and they particularly decline with the dementias. So that's why they were so attractive. And they're not so selectively targeted at the subsets. They're a global problem, a global metabolic problem, you know, in yeah. the dementia population. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very exciting and especially when we hear the results, but just to be clear, to, to emphasize to everybody, this is a safety study and a little bit of efficacy also that we're gonna look at, but it's very, very early, very preliminary. It's done in humans as we'll see. Uh, so um, yeah, what did you, uh, how did you set up the study then? So uh, safety studies, if you look at, uh, if you look at the gene therapy studies that we do in the United States, around the world really, uh, the initial studies are two to eight patients. So we had five, uh, typically for a safety study, you need a low number and you're not looking for statistical significance of does it work or not? You're looking for complications from the therapy. Uh, does, it, does it not do any, does it do anything you don't expect it to do? Does it have any bad effects? That's why we call it a safety study. Now, it's great if you, could, if you can also gather efficacy data and we were very fortunate and we can, and that really depends on the type of the disease you're looking at. Um, so we set it up to look at five patients. Uh, we gave them a fixed dose of HTER and uh, uh, Clotho, uh, AAV, the uh, uh, adeno-associated virus, very common virus. Uh, used, and it has some particular things that are very attractive to it um, that people watching the show may want to know. So let me, let me divert right back into that real quick. So one of the things about HTERT that everybody is afraid of historically is, is will it cause turn on a cancer? Will it cause a cancer? That's a big fear because it turns out that HTERT makes telomerase, which its main role is normal role when it functions normally is to protect the ends of your chromosomes from fusing together, being recognized as a broken strand, uh, being subjected to mutations which could cause a cancer. So the, the, telomer, the, the telomere maintained by the telomerase is like this mitten over the end of your chromosome. And you, it gets removed, the copy, the chromosome, the DNA, it gets put back. Um, but as you 
go through life and that cell gets copied, the DNA gets copied, the mit on and off, the mitten starts to shrink. It gets nibbled at. Um, it a little bit gets chewed off every time. And so uh, the normal process is the, the mitten eventually gets so short that the DNA can't be protected any longer. And the cell under, is there, undergoes senescence. It says to itself, my DNA is at risk of mutation, so I'm going to kill myself. So it commits suicide, apoptosis, planned programmed cell death. Well, cancer, it turns out the way a lot of cancers work is they make telomerase. They have a mutation that allows them to make telomerase, not all of them, but uh, enough. And so they can immortalize themselves. That's one of the, one of the very uh, troubling and things about cancer, disturbing things about cancer cells is they immortalize themselves and they grow and grow and grow. Uh, they don't die of senescence. They don't undergo apoptosis. When they get a mutation, they don't say I'm faulty, I need to kill myself. They ignore it and grow more. So they mutate more and more. Um, it turns out that giving, there's been a number of studies that giving telomerase, giving HTERT genes to cells does not increase the chance of cancer uh, through AAV uh, because of where the, the gene goes uh, and where it doesn't go. So I won't go into all the details, but there's a long history uh, per, the undeniable scientific data that documents that AV delivered telomerase doesn't induce a cancer in patients. So, so let's just put that to rest. Okay. Now, um, where was I going when you, what was the question you asked me? Oh yeah, no, we uh, just talking about, uh, the, the, well, one question just comes up on the delivery system. You're talking about oh, where yeah, does yeah. it go? Okay. Um, yeah, that's how I got on the AV. Yeah, so so we chose AV uh, because it has been around for about almost fifty years. Uh, we've it's been used in the laboratory and in many many human and almost and probably almost all of the human uh, gene transfer therapies that have been done in the world. Um, it's very common. It's a very common virus that we use this for, um, and. Uh, the way it, I went into the way it works, um, it, with the, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Oh, uh, no problem. What, yeah. One thing, one thing we could expand on a little bit is uh, the delivery system. You went through the nasal mucosa and, and. Oh, with the, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Let's talk about the study particularly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we chose the AAV and we loaded in the clotho and we loaded in the telomerase. And how to get it into the central nervous system is an issue. Um, you, you have to, some of the studies in the past, uh, there was a study where they injected it directly into the brain with a needle, uh, which of course you have to drill a hole through the bone and that's somewhat undesirable as you can imagine. Not many people would go for that. Um, and, and this was actually a, a double blind study where they did placebo and gene therapy. So, you know, it's, it's hard to talk people into getting a, a hole drilled in their skull and needle stuck in their brain and tell them you may or may not get the therapy. And, and there's some ethical issues with that too. Um, so uh, the other way is injected into the cerebral spinal fluid, which, uh, which is not a, it's a, it's a common procedure to access the cerebral spinal fluid. We stick a needle in the back into the spine. Uh, we sample that fluid all the time for looking for infection, meningitis, et cetera, but it does carry a risk and it's, uh, and there's some problems. There's some simple complications that can mess your life up for a few days, like a bad headache where you can't get up out of the bed all the way to in introducing an infection. Um, we came up with a, a less invasive way. We go through the nasal mucosa in the nose. So I inject it under the skin inside the nose, which we call the mucosa. Uh, and it gets absorbed and goes up the olfactory nerve, one of the cranial nerves, and it goes into the brain. How do we know this? We did some studies with rats where we tagged it with a radionucleotide or a fluorescent dye, and we inject it, and, and then you sacrifice the rat, and you look at the, and you, can, and you image the brain, or you 
microscope look at the brain and you can see the tracer, which carried the, 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 delivery, the target with it. Um, so in, this, in, the, in the patient, they received intranasal dose of, of an enzyme which allow which which uh, allowed the uh, in, improve the absorption of the virus into the olfactory into the CNS, um, and the gene. So they got an enzyme, and then a little while, a few minutes later they get the gene therapy, and then 15 minutes later we're done. So it's two little injections inside your nose, which is uh, more palatable. Uh, it's not comfortable. Uh, but it's it's well tolerated um and it's easy to do so it's particularly attractive for a number of reasons very little discomfort uh it's not complex to administer you don't need imaging equipment um but it's it's it has it carries a low risk uh to technically of messing it up i mean the worst thing you could do basically is not get it under the skin but squirt it down their nose and waste it uh, so there's a number of features. It was it was a uh, number of reasons we we like that method, and but but more importantly, the studies we did in animals documented that it went to the brain where we wanted it to go. Um, so that was the that's the actual procedure. Now we wanted to know with the study once we did it what was going to happen, uh, and with the safety study we we're looking for problems like with the brain, stroke, intracranial bleeding, infection, uh, any kind of morphologic change in the brain anatomy, et cetera. So before, the, before we injected them, we did an MRI of the brain. And 10 months later, we did an MRI of the brain. Um, we collected lab blood on them. We did chemistries and all the blood studies you can imagine. Uh, we looked at a bunch, of, a bunch of every parameter we could think of. Uh, related to the procedure and the gene therapy and the cascade of, of metabolic events that would happen if the gene therapy worked. We were prepared to detect any changes. Um, and, we, uh, and we also measured the telomeres in the DNA. Um, and we can, do that, we can do that in anybody by drawing their blood. Uh, it's a test, a lab test we do. And what does that, what did, and, and what that to all these studies told us, I'll get into in just a second. So um, all, the all the patients were uh, recruited for the safety study and uh, administered it, the therapy after they had all their pre-therapy imaging and blood work. And we also did cognitive testing. Um, there's a study called the Folstein test that you administered to, to Alzheimer's patients. And uh, it's, a, it's a word association, uh, character recognition, memory test, uh, uh, cognition test. Can you, how, you know, can you problem solve? Can you remember this five minutes later? This, can you say this backwards? Can you count backwards, et cetera? Um, it's a very, it's one of the, it's probably one of the most common tests that, that is used for the assessment of cognitive function and the decline of cognitive function in patients with dementia. Alzheimer's patients typically drop routinely or predictably drop their score three points a year. It's a 30 point, 30 point score. So every year at 27, next year I'll be at 24, then I'll be at 21. Nobody reverses. The nature of dementia is you, your, your memory starts, your memory declines, your critical thinking declines, um, association declines. So we studied the patients with all that before, and then we repeated it afterwards. Um, the most intriguing part, uh, results came from the telomere analysis and the uh, Folstein test. Now, the safety being the safety study, I was interested in the MRI, the brain MRI. Um, a lot of people that I tell the results to were disappointed I didn't see any changes in the brain MRI, any improvement in the brain, but it was only 10 months apart. Um, so I didn't expect any regrowth of a shrinking hippocampus, which is what, you know, the reversing of the, that might, in two years, I might show up in three years, we might be able to measure some changes or with some more sophisticating imaging. But what I was mainly interested in was they didn't have any abnormalities of their brain. The brain looked identical, uh, which is good news. That's what I wanted to see. Um, their, their hematological analysis was 
straight uh, was unchanged, no infection, no sign of infection, no immunological suppression, et cetera. Um, now with the, with the cognitive testing, the scores went up, which was evidence that the treatment improved them. I mean, that, that is improvement. It's the definition of improvement. Their memory got better. Uh, they remembered, we had a patient that remembered names of relatives that they had forgotten for 10 years. Um, personalities came back. Pe patients, I had one patient that was a retired scientist and he routinely read scientific journals and watched news programs. And he quit doing that and he started reading scientific journals again. Um, I had patient, one of the patients, uh, well, several of the patients regained the ability to do simple everyday tasks, like make a meal for themselves, go in the kitchen, make a meal, put everything up, get everything out, put everything up. Um, the skills that they had lost, they got back. Memory that had declined returned. Memories that had, that had been lost. Um, uh, and the, the test scores reflected that. All of the test scores went up. Um, some more than others. Now, the, the, which is very exciting. Um, and it's been sustained over the year. There's a sharp increase at three and a half, up to three months, and then it's sustained across the board. A tiny little dip of 0.7 per month. So it's starting to slowly decline, but I, don't, I have to follow that over time. Um, the telomere analysis. When I measure your telomeres, uh, if, if you're 50 and I measure your telomeres and it says you're 50, that's your chronological age and your biological age. But if I can lengthen your telomeres, it means your cell will live longer. So you have a younger biological age. And that's, that's a, a, a function of administering more h -tert to someone. So with these patients, when we measure their telomeres before and after treatment, and all of the telomeres were lengthened. The short, the cells approaching senescence became younger and will live longer. The ones with median telomeres, they will live longer. So we actually have a human study where we showed we lengthened telomeres in cells. And the implication is that those cells will live longer. But I mean, I can't, when that once they do live longer, I can say they did, but in the animals, they live longer. I mean, we can give telomerase to animals and make them live three times as long as their twin. Um, so that's the highlights of those are the two really take home effects. Uh, the hard data showed increased Folstein test and lengthening of telomeres. Wow, that's that's really remarkable. The, the telomere lengthening. Um, if the in, you measured it from the blood samples for the telomeres, um, it, but the injection was in the nasal mucosa of the H tert, is the effect on the blood is that just because it's the some of the genes were distributed, some of the the adenovirus vectors were distributed in the bloodstream um, sure. in addition to the so, brain? Is that why you see that? Right, right. <laughs> they uh, the 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 virus travels up the nerve and disperses throughout the brain, in the brain tissue, in the CSL, in the blood that's passing through the brain. And the blood passing through the brain has white blood cells, leukocytes. We measure telomeres on leukocytes. Why do we measure telomeres on leukocytes? No matter what organ we're talking about. If I injected your, your kidney, I would measure the telomeres in your leukocytes in your blood. Because the, there's been a number of studies that have documented that leukocyte telomere length corresponds to somatic telomere length. So the cell, the telomere in your white blood cell is representative of the telomere length in your kidney cell, in your neuron cell, in your muscle cell. Um, and because it circulates, it, it picked up some of the, it went through the brain and the AV virus latched onto some of the leukocytes. And so that's where we have the sample. Now we, we could sample the brain, uh, by drilling in the brain and taking a piece. And that's what we do in the animals, of course. But in humans, we have to, this is the best we can do, the non-invasive method. So, so the, the Fullstein test uh, is really the test for cognition, which is the definition of dementia. And you, you showed reversal on that. And then the, uh, the telomere measurements is for the H-TERT re reverse transcriptase, telomere, telomerase reverse transcriptase. And it shows the effect of that. I'm wondering... Are there any biomarkers for clotho uh, that that would indicate 
that the clotho is working other than you know secondary dementia things like that um there are some uh there are some handmade clotho lab tests they're not you can't they're not available so you have to be a, a scientist in the in the clotho world that you could make a, a reagent measure yourself um so we don't have that available now uh, hopefully one day um the evidence that the the clotho worked is prior uh uh prior work with uh animals shows that the clotho reverses improves cognition in animals in fact we had there was a study that of uh, some uh mice that but there are a number of studies of clotho in in animals and uh but clotho in general improves intelligence in mice 30 percent the mice were 30 percent smarter uh within hours of getting clotho in this one study and by smarter they 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 had them do a may a maze uh they had them do some testing that that they felt represented their ability to problem solve um so what exactly uh goes on with the, how much the clotho is effective is a mystery right now but i think it's a key part um but the 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 dementia i mean the telomere the the telomerase has implications to, to anti-aging which was why it was very interesting. While the, if I can lengthen your telomeres, uh, human telomeres, and we know lengthened human telomeres make a cell live longer. Uh, I mean, this is really, I'm not aware of any studies that humans have gotten HTERT and had their telomeres measured uh, and they've lived longer. So we'll have to see how these, these patients do. But that's one of the promises of HTERT and telomerase is a longer life. Yeah, now... Now you just completed the the safety study and published it. Um, we'll have the links down below for the publication, um, the safety and some beginning efficacy data. So what's next on this? Uh, are you starting another study? What, what's what's the roadmap downstream? Right, right. So um, this study was sponsored by a nonprofit. The, this it's expensive to do this. Uh, so the not the nonprofit uh, gave us the money to treat these patients. Um, I'm hoping that there will be interest in more somebody more funding to do a larger study because phase two would be 30 to 50 patients, uh, which is going to be a lot more expensive, more sophisticated imaging, more sophisticated cognitive analysis. Uh, so it's not just 30 times, I mean, not five patients, uh, not six times if I do 30 patients, the, I'm going to have to expand the doses, the imaging, the cognitive testing, it's, uh, the, 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 the uh, whole process is going to be multiplied in cost. So uh, I don't have an active next step until hopefully somebody calls me up and says, hey, I love I want to pursue this. I'm interested in this. I have, uh, I happen to own a, a billion dollar company and uh, I got, I want to invest in something. So here, here's a lab and here's a, and hire some scientists and hire some, you know, hire who you need and let's, let's go. Um, so we're yeah. in a, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, biomedical drug development is hugely expensive and, and gene therapy, development is even more expensive and the nice thing about drug development at least when you get the drug the actual per cost of the drug is fairly low other than the research and development cost but gene transfer therapy on the other hand has still a, a high cost of just the customization for individual patients how do you see future economies of scale driving down that price? And what would what would this what do, what do you envision this in the future to look like if if this could be rolled out at scale? So there's actually uh, some recent work done by a a guy at Harvard who did uh, some groundbreaking groundbreaking research on AAV capsids, and the 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 capsid is the coating is outside of the AV virus. And it's what your immune system recognizes. And he had discovered and developed uh, a way 
to select out capsids that are tissue avid. For instance, if I want to give it to the brain, there's a way to uh, finagle things. So I make the AV virus with the capsids that the, my immune system looks at those capsids and thinks they're the same as my neuron. So it, it doesn't address it. Now, why is that important? Uh, if I give you a dose of a drug and, and half of it is consumed by your immune system, then there's an administered dose and there's effective dose. The administered dose might be 100 milligrams, but if 50 milligrams gets consumed or lost, then the effective dose is, on, is the other half, only 50 milligrams. So I've, I've had to pay for twice the drug for you to get, you only got half of what I paid for because the other half was lost. It can be lost in your GI tract if it's a pill, it cannot be absorbed, et cetera. So one of the things that will drive down costs will be uh, being able to lower the dose of viral particles, lower the dose of the drugs instead of, a, uh, instead of a million viral particles. What if I could get away with 100,000? Then that would be one uh, uh, tenth of the cost, you see, because the cost is directly related to the volume of the drug in, in terms of gene therapy right now. Um, so anything we can do to reduce the administered dose so our effective dose stays the same will give you a lower cost. Now, the other thing is, since this study, since we started the study and when we finished, the cost of gene therapy has doubled because of the COVID-19 vaccines. They use a lot of the same reagents and laboratories that we use. And so there's, it's a supply and demand. There's a... Uh, uh, the prices have gone up because, and it takes longer to produce the gene therapies now because all, a lot of the same technology, the gene transfer technology is used in the COVID vaccine production. I mean, that's what I found a little humorous is the, a lot of the talk about the vaccines was, oh, this is brand new breaking, blah, 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 technology. It's not really brand new breaking. The way they did it with removing some administrative restraints, et cetera, and sped up the process was, and there were a few things they did that were groundbreaking, but, the, but essentially the COVID-19 vaccines are similar technology that's been around for a while. And they've consumed a lot of the resources. So, that's, so once that stabilizes and we get, we get some expansion in that market, in the production side, that's one way it'll drive it down. Another way is uh, uh, reducing the dose the required dose by modulating the immune system better, by evading the immune system. Um, and then lastly, anything you scale up, uh, supply goes up, you make more of it, the price drops in general. I mean, like an iPhone, you know, or uh, that's just, that's the economic side of, of large scale use. When you personalize something and make it unique, it's very expensive to produce because it's a small scale. Um, but if we can, mass produce it or produce it in greater quantities will drive the scale down. Um, interestingly, though, you know, the drug that was approved, I can't remember the name of it, to, to bind to the amyloid uh, the, the, this year, the, the amyloid uh, protein. I think it costs 5000 a month or 10000 a month or something like that. The, the gene therapy that we do is comparable to that, but it's only a one-time dose. I mean, a year's worth. So if I could, I could give you, if that's what frustrates me sometimes is the money is there to pay for that drug, but not for this gene therapy. And the cost is comparable if you look at a one year supply. So it's expensive, but then it's really not expensive if you look at the cost of medicine. Yeah. And the drug doesn't even reverse the symptoms. Uh, exactly. so, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's even more frustrating. So, uh, but you know, uh, this is brand new data. It's it's uh, was published last week, so I couldn't expect them to know this eight months ago. You know, but hopefully somebody will take notice and uh, and and with a little time, this things will change. Yeah, I I also um, I also love the work you're doing with your with your personal practice, and maybe you could take a moment and talk about how how you. Um, You've, you've crafted your practice around uh, patients with challenging problems that may not be able to find solutions elsewhere and uh, how you go about doing that. Right. So, um, you know, 
the greatest satisfaction a physician can have is being successful at helping somebody, um, helping them. And I've expanded, and my perception of helping them is not just me helping them, but by association, helping them get where they need to be. And sometimes that means I refer them to the right physician. It's hard to find, if you're not in the medical field, it's hard to know where to go. Um, so it's not very uncommon for me at all to speak to patients and say, I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything to offer you, but I know somebody who does, or I know somebody who is researching that. Um, so I do a lot of that. So uh, I like to hear about unusual problems because it, it piques my interest. And there's a lot of overlap. If you look at my career between cancer and, I mean, who would think cancer and gene therapy are connected, uh, but they're actually more connected. Uh, and we can't go into this sh show into this while we're here, but gene therapy and cancer for cancer is a possibility in the very near future, something I'm working on. Um, just to give you an example, but nobody would ever thought gene therapy and cancer, I mean, they just don't sound like they go together. So you never know what's going to connect. So I spend my time, patients contact me uh, for things they think I can help them with, things that they hope I can help them with, or maybe just because nobody else will listen to them, and I might be able to steer them in the right direction. So I have, I have patients and doctors who say, uh, call Patrick Sewell. He, he might be able to help you or he might know somebody who does. And that's kind of the nature of my practice. And out of that, I get a lot, meet a lot of interesting people. I get to help people, some directly and some indirectly. Um, that's, that's the way I like to do it. Yeah, so how can people, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? And also how can they follow you on social media and other contacts? Um, well, I, I, I really, you know what, I don't really do any social media. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, and that's a professional thing, because that's where I keep track with a lot of the doctors I've met over the years. But uh, I, I guess they could email me. Um, is there, I don't know if you could put that in the... Sure, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. And also some of our audience will be listening to this on, on headphones. So maybe you could just uh, tell, us, tell us your email address as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's Dr. Sewell at cancerimmunebio.com. It's kind of screwed up. It's not an easy one. Cancer, C-A-N-C-E-R, immune, I-M-M-U-N-E, bio, B-I-O, dot com. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah. We'll, we'll include it in the show notes as well so people uh, oh, can, can find it there. Yeah, it's D-R Sewell, not, not the word doctor, but D-R-S-E-W-E-L-L -L at cancerimmunebio.com. Yeah, uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I talked to so many patients with interesting complex problems that it's, uh, which then sparks me to read about stuff, which sparks other ideas. And that's how I end up putting stuff together. Uh, so. Yeah, this is, this is such an exciting time in medicine with so many new ideas and, and like the work that you're doing uh, with uh, your, your project as well. It's a great time to be in the space, not only for the, the providers like us, but also for the, the people and the patients out there because their things are possible now that weren't possible five or 10 years, years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Pat, for taking an hour of your time to uh, chat today and get to know you. And I, I just want to thank you for, for being on the show, but also thank you for all the, the great work you're doing. Absolutely, Rob. I appreciate you having me. This is for general information and educational purposes only, and it's not intended to constitute or substitute for medical advice or counseling. The practice of medicine or the provision of health care diagnosis or treatment or the creation of a phys physician, patient, or clinical relationship. The use of this information is at their own, uh, own user's risk. If you find this to be on the value, please hit that like button to subscribe to support the work that we do on this channel. And we take the, your suggestions and advice very seriously. So please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time.